This is a Know Your Rights training for activists. Um, my name is Lauren Regan. I'm the executive director and staff attorney of the Civil Liberties Defense Center. And we're an organization um, primarily located down in Eugene. And for the last 10 years, um, we've basically been an activist legal tool, um, support, trainings. Act we've uh, defended over 900 activists in the last 10 years uh, for free. And I also uh, sue police and government agencies on behalf of activists. And uh, more recently, we have been involved in the national tar sands resistance. And I've been uh, going to Texas and Oklahoma and North Dakota and Utah uh, doing training similar to this, as well as representing those campaigns when TransCanada sues them for slap suits, which we'll talk about uh, in this training as well. So the training is geared to be not only a basic know your rights that everybody should know, you know, with regard to interacting with police on the street or what your basic constitutional rights are, but we'll add a little extra to this training dealing with issues that come up more often with social change activists. Um, we will kind of cover civil disobedience. Um, we will kind of cover more particulars pertaining to rallies and demos and things that you um, might have a particular interest in. Um, if possible, try to hold on to your questions at the end because it's likely I may cover it as we progress through the training. Training normally takes about an hour. Um, and a couple of just preliminary things. When I use the word cop in this training, I am really referring to any form of law enforcement. So it could be sheriff, it could be Portland police, it could be FBI or even campus security. For the purpose of this training, uh, the same rules and regs apply to all of them with regard to your rights. So um, don't be confused if I use that term to just kind of make us uh, flow through the, the training a little quicker. Um, if you ha ever have any questions on legal jargon that I use during the training, feel free to raise your hand right away with that and I will try to follow up with some extra definitions. Uh, so this is my contact info and CLDC's contact info. I'll put it back up at the end, but if you think of a question after the training is over or if you work with another organization that would like a training uh, down the road, feel free to contact us. Uh, we're happy to try and schedule as many as uh, we can fit into our schedule. So this training is premised on US constitutional law, which means that most of what I'm gonna tell you today would be applicable in any state that you traveled to within the US uh, or US territory. If there is something particular regarding Oregon law, I will make sure and uh, uh, clarify that we're talking about some kind of state specific law. But the training is basically going to cover your Fifth Amendment right, your right to remain silent, your Fourth Amendment right, which is your right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures, also called your right to privacy, uh, and your First Amendment rights, which is your right to protest, your right to free speech and assembly. So your Fifth Amendment right is probably one of the most important rights that you have. And in a nutshell, it basically says that you never, ever, ever have to answer any questions that anyone puts to you. The only person that can ever compel you to answer a question is a judge in a courtroom. And so wherever you may be, if you ever are thinking to yourself, do I really have to answer that? The, question, the answer to that question is always going to be no, unless you're in a courtroom. So generally speaking, particularly in the activist uh, gamut, it's always best to exercise your Fifth Amendment right and remain silent. And the red words that you see at the bottom of this slide, we call those magic words. And the reason we do that is these are phrases that we want you to memorize. And we want you to memorize them because, number one, when you're dealing with cops, it's usually a stressful situation. The adrenaline is pumping. And we want these phrases to be the words that come out of your mouth instead of some of the other stuff that I've had to read in police reports that never should have come out of anyone's mouth. Uh, and then number two, 
the phrases are sort of legalese, meaning it's not the normal way that people say stuff. And it tends to cause a very different reaction when you're interacting with police. You know, if you say, officer, what's the reasonable suspicion for my detention today? You know, generally speaking, the cop is going to respond to you in a very different way uh, than they may have, you know, started the conversation with. Um, also, on the activist front, normally at demonstrations and protests, you will have selected a police liaison to be the person who is designated to interact with law enforcement. Other activists should normally not be seen or should not be conversing with the police unless they've been authorized by the group to be the police liaison. Not only does it look, make it look like you might be cooperating with the police or giving information to the police, but it also generally goes outside of the protocols that most organizations set up for demonstrations and rallies. Um, don't forget that anything you say can and will be used against you, and more importantly, may be used against others. So the Fourth Amendment is also your right to privacy, you know, that idea that your home is your castle. And this constitutional right is probably one of the most threatened rights that we have at this point in time. The Fourth Amendment basically says that police or the government can't search or seize your possessions without certain things happening. And generally speaking, the most common way that the police enter your home or search your backpack is because you consent to it. And consent means that you agree to it. Um, in lawyer land, in, in case law, silence equals consent. And so if a police officer walks up to you and says, can I search your backpack, and you stand there silently, uh, in terms of how that will play out in the court, you've literally said, yes, officer, please search my backpack. And so in order to effect your consent, you have to say it out loud and in words. And so the magic words will be, you know, I don't consent to this search. The other ways that the police can get into your private business is if they obtain a search warrant or if there's an exception to the search warrant. So a, a search warrant is basically a piece of paper that is signed by a judge. It has a date and a time that they're allowed to search. It has a location and it has a list of what they're allowed to take. If you're home when the police show up with a search warrant, you have the right to inspect that search warrant. If you're not home when they show up, they have the right to bust down the door and enter without you knowing that they're there, and then they leave an evidence list tacked to the uh, front door of your house, usually. Now, if the warrant says they can search the house, but they can't search the cars, and you look out the window of your house and they're rooting through your glove box, you don't want to point out that they are going beyond the scope of the search warrant. Because anything that they search beyond the search warrant means that they did not have legal permission to do that. And that stuff that they find will be thrown out as being beyond the scope of the search warrant. But if you say, hey, that's not on here, the police are allowed to do what's called a telephonic search warrant, which means they whip out their cell phones and call the court and, you know, and basically get extra permission for the stuff that they forgot about. And it's instantaneous. So you don't want to give them the ability to correct a mistake or to broaden the scope of a search warrant. Next is, oh, well, let me just back up. And there are some exceptions to the search warrant rule. And the most common is what's called exigent circumstances, which is also called hot pursuit or emergency exceptions. And this is basically when you know, the police are chasing a murderer down your street, the murderer runs into your garage. The police are going to be able to enter your garage without a search warrant and without your consent because they're in hot pursuit. Crime is happening right now. Now, once they get in your garage and they get the bad guy, if they look around and find your meth lab, they're now allowed to bust you for your meth lab because that is what's called the plain view exception. If I can see it, if the police can see it in plain view, they're going to be able to search it, seize it, deal with it. You know, another common example, unfortunately, 
police officers walking down the street looks in your front window and sees your meth lab on the coffee table and the curtains are drawn, uh, they're going to be able to now enter your house to bust you for the meth lab. So First Amendment, uh, also critically important, and also one of those rights that we have that if we don't exercise and enforce it, we lose it. You know, I find that a lot of activists self-censor themselves. We think the First Amendment is a lot more narrow than it actually is. You know, the First Amendment allows you to sing, dance, burn the American flag, be nude, use profanity, you can even advocate for the overthrow of government, and it's all protected under the First Amendment. The two things that aren't really protected are um, you know, yelling fire in a crowded movie theater, or what's called slander or defamation, where you knowingly tell a lie about someone or a company, and it causes that company or that person economic harm. You know, they lose their job or they lose a bunch of sales or something along those lines. But the key part to that, just for those of you that work in this world of activism, is that it has to be a known lie. You know, it, it can't just be a mistake of information. You have to be you know, purposely smearing uh, bad information in order to cause economic harm. Now, your free speech rights vary depending on the location that you are exercising them. There are three different types of First Amendment analysis that the courts will engage in to see whether or not you really did have the right to be somewhere. So the first is called public forums, and this is where you have the maximum amount of First Amendment rights. It's things like public parks and public sidewalks, places that historically a soapbox would be set up and free speech would be accepted. Um, you know, marching on the streets, national forest lands, you know, those were all traditional public forums. The only way that the government can restrict those types of rights is by what's called a time, place, and manner restriction. Um, what that means is the state cannot control the content of your speech. They can't tell you, you can talk about the Democrats, but you can't talk about the Republicans, for instance. But what they can potentially uh, alter is the time, the place, and the manner. So, you know, you may not be able to have a home demonstration at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, because that is a time, you know, time, place, and manner restriction. Uh, you may not be able to use fire as part of your expression in certain locations. Um, you might have to get a permit for a rally or an event in front of the federal courthouse if you're having over 75 people. Those types of restrictions have been upheld by the courts as reasonable. And so when you're planning events, you know, one of the things that you should be thinking about is where do we want to have this event and what do we want to do and, you know, where, where are we going to have it? Uh, Quasi-public forums, the most common example is college campuses. You know, there might be some places where free speech might be accepted, but, you know, for me to march into a biology classroom protesting the killing of frogs is probably not going to be constitutionally protected because free speech would not be expected in a science classroom. And then finally, you have the least amount of First Amendment rights on private property and private forums. And especially here in Oregon, our courts have ruled that places like malls are private property. And so the way that works is if the owner of the property or the person in charge of the property tells you to leave for any reason, you have to leave or you will potentially face trespass charges. So private forums, you have the least amount of First Amendment rights. Um, the last part of that slide is just mentioning that every state also has a constitution and sometimes certain constitution, state constitutional rights can either expand or limit some of these rights. Uh, here in Oregon, our constitution is generally considered uh, more protective of First Amendment rights than even the U.S. Constitution. So this slide is basically trying to illustrate that although everybody has the same constitutional rights, whether you're a citizen or not, you know, whether you're eight or you're 80, we all have the same constitutional rights. But people here 
um, that might be part of your protest that are either undocumented or are here on a visa, um, their rights are obviously a little more tenuous because if people are here on a visa, one of the conditions to that visa was that they would not engage in political activity. And the same for us when we travel places on a visa. So if everybody gets arrested at a protest and one of your comrades is here on a visa, um, not only did they get arrested, which is never good, but now it's been proven that they were engaging in political activity, which can be cause for deportation. So just be aware as you're organizing that some people have greater risk um, in, in exercising First Amendment rights than others. Um, one other thing I will just mention, there are some cities that are passing laws that restrict wearing masks or um, you know, certain kinds of tactics. Um, sometimes before big protests like May Day, for instance, uh, rules might be passed saying nobody can carry sticks or nobody can wear uh, you know, hoodies or you know, all sorts of different things like that. Some of those things are totally unconstitutional. Others uh, you know, have passed muster in certain occasions. But the one thing you need to know is if a place passes a law like that, even if it's patently unconstitutional, you need to prepare your fellow activists that in challenging what looks like an unconstitutional law, they will likely be arrested and put through the court system. Uh, and that's important when you, especially if you're an organizer, um, you know, if you've got parents and you know, families and little kids, you know, those are concerns that you need to take into account as you're uh, planning your, your activity. So a lot of people ask, you know, after the Patriot Act was passed, uh, did we lose all of our constitutional rights? And it is true that the Patriot Act is pretty much the largest abomination to our constitutional rights in a very, very long time period. But no law can trump the Constitution. The only way that the government can suspend constitutional rights is by passing martial law, which has only been passed twice in the history of the United States, and it is an act of Congress. So we would probably know about it if it happened. But one thing that the Patriot Act did do is it passed a provision called the sneak and peek search. And what that did was it allowed federal agents, most often FBI, to be able to enter your home without a warrant. So now they don't even have to go to that judge for the checks and balances. They enter your home without a warrant, they can download your computer and look through your underwear drawer and leave without letting you know that they were there. They don't have to post that evidence sheet, they take it to a secret FISA court, and um, you may never know that the, the feds were in there. Um, in Oregon, there was a case, Brandon Mayfield um, was here in Portland. He was a lawyer uh, and a Muslim, and the government wrongfully identified his fingerprints as being involved in the Madrid train bombing. And so without his knowledge, the feds had been entering his home and searching his house as well as his law office. And eventually they arrest him, they attempt to prosecute him, while the Madrid government is calling us and saying, hey, you screwed up, we actually have the guy, your fingerprint is wrong. Um, he got out of jail and he sued the FBI for those searches and won. And one of the things they found out is the FBI had actually gone into his home and stole some of his children's finger paintings that were on the refrigerator in the kitchen because those were the secret plot maps for the Madrid train bombing. So the lesson there is never overestimate the FBI and law enforcement. You know, we often give them too much credit uh, for their prowess in, uh, in investigating us. The next part of this training is focusing on interacting with cops. Um, you know, whether you get pulled over for speeding, whether you run into one on the street, one shows up at your rally or shows up at your door. Um, you know, interacting with cops can always be a stressful situation. Um, but what we want you to do, in order to figure out what your rights are when you're interacting with police, you need to figure out what level of interaction you are at with the cop. And there's three different levels, mere conversation, detention, and arrest. 
And the reason it's important to figure out where you are at is because there's different rules and rights that come along with each one of these stages. Okay, so before we dive into that, a couple of tips for interacting with cops. Uh, number one, try to always keep your hands visible when you're interacting with a police officer. If you get pulled over in your car, put them on the steering wheel. If you're out on the streets, make sure that they're down at your sides and not stuffed in your pockets. Cops are hyper alert um, for you grabbing a weapon and potentially harming them. And to keep them calm while interacting with you, uh, keeping your hands in plain view is always kind of a smart idea. Try to stay where other people are and where it's well lit. Um, you should assume that you're being recorded from the minute you begin interacting with police. They almost all will have audio recording capability, and generally speaking, many will have video uh, recording capability as well. And in particular, every cop car has a video, basically where the rear view mirror is, pointing at the back seat. And if I had to tell you how many videos I've had to watch of people doing the craziest things in the back of a cop car, thinking no one is seeing them, I would be a rich woman right now. Um, also, if you do have the unfortunate experience of ending up in a jail cell, know that a lot of jail cells are also audio, video recorded. And you should always assume that every word you say into a jail telephone is recorded. Now, we, the people, also have the right to record police in public. This is one of those areas of the law that is pretty state specific. But in Oregon, uh, the CLDC actually litigated the federal case that basically proved that in a public place with a public officer doing his public duties, they have no right to privacy. And so we have the right to audio and video record police in public places. Now, to be on the safe side, we advise cop watchers, which are those folks that purposely go to uh, rallies and protests to be the video camera and to be the eyes and ears of a protest, we advise them to put the law enforcement people that are there on notice that they're recording. So to be absolutely the safest you could possibly be in doing this job, we advise you to just say, I am recording into your camera so that there is proof that you gave notice that you're recording. Now, of course, seeing a big camera in their face or you know, seeing you holding your phone like this should put them on notice that you're recording. But you know, because so many people have gotten arrested while recording the police because they are frustrated that you are doing so, uh, adding that little extra precaution in will hopefully make you safer. Um, Police might tell you to move eight to 10 feet back. They might tell you to move across the street while recording. We advise people to just kind of take baby steps backward while continuing to film. Once the cops go back to their job, stop and continue recording. If the cop does say though, you have to get across the street, if you don't get across the street, you're probably gonna be arrested for not doing that. And if your role is cop watching, your footage and your camera is extremely valuable and we really don't want you getting arrested if you've taken on that job. Also, if you have gotten something really critical, you just videotaped the police beating uh, you know, the bejesus out of someone, that footage now is really, really valuable and we want you to take it off site. We want you to bring it to your car and lock it up. We want you to download it, email it, whatever you have to do so that in the event you get jumped by the cops, that footage won't disappear. Um, and like I mentioned, um, the rules for cop watching and the rules for videotaping police really do vary from state to state. So before you, you know, whip out a camera, in the state other than Oregon, take a quick look at the rules for videotaping police. All right, so that mirror conversation stage. You know, I could walk up to every one of you and ask you what's your social security number and what's your bank account balance. And of course you could tell me, you know, I don't want to tell you that. Well, the same is true with police at the mere conversation stage. Police are allowed to enter anywhere that the public is allowed to enter. And they're allowed to ask you anything that the public would be allowed to ask you. But they have the same exact reverse rights as well. You know, we have the right to simply tell them we don't wish to speak with them. 
The way you figure out whether you're at the conversation stage is by asking the police officer, am I being detained? And if he says, well, no, you're not being detained. I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Then you should basically say something like, I don't wish to speak with you and slowly put some distance between you and the officer. If he says, yes, you are being detained, then you know you're at level two, detention. Um, so am I being detained? Yes or no? Uh, you can also say, am I free to go, if you can't remember that detained word. Uh, but like I said, you know, we kind of chose that word particularly to have a certain impact on, on the police. Um, definitely know that anything you say can and will be used against you and someone else. Sometimes the police are asking innocuous questions, but they are gathering information on your movement, on leaders, on organizers, etc. It's not the time to be having chit chat with law enforcement. Um, as I mentioned before, you need to you know, say these words out loud in order to affect um, communication with law enforcement. Um, now, I mentioned to you that um, silence is considered agreement. And you know, definitely remember that um, Any time a police officer asks you a question, um, you, know, you always have the right to say, you know, I'd rather assert my Fifth Amendment rights and not speak with you. Uh, and we'll kind of go over that a little more too. Now, at the detention stage, this is where law enforcement is allowed to hold on to you. you know, they're allowed to restrict your movements. In order to detain someone, the police have to have a reasonable suspicion that you have either committed a crime or are about to commit a crime. So if the answer to am I being detained is yes, that means that the cops think you broke the law or are about to break the law. And that means you need to kind of focus with a little more seriousness because you're about a foot away from the backseat of a cop car. Now, a reasonable suspicion has to be more than a mere hunch. Uh, it has to be able to be put into words, what's called the articulable suspicion, um, which just means articulate it or say it out loud. Um, and you know, reasonable suspicion has to be evidence that a reasonable person would use to believe that you've committed a crime. But of course, if you are breaking the law in front of the police, like you're locking down to the front doors of Bank of America, you're breaking the law in front of the police and that there's clearly going to be probable cause there. Um, but they can also use a single witness or a single informant in order to form probable cause to arrest you. Now, arresting you and forming probable cause, don't forget, is very different than convicting you. You know, they may be able to stuff you in a cop car and put you in jail, but there's a whole different standard to be able to actually prove that you're guilty of a crime. Uh, so again, you know, if you are, if a police officer walks up to you or pulls you over or, you know, has any kind of contact with you, am I being detained? And if the police officer says, yes, you're being detained, your next question should be, why? Why am I being detained? Make them tell you what their reasonable suspicion is. And the reason this is important is because if the cop tells you you're being stopped for suspicion of burglary, and then you get your police reports and it says they smelled marijuana and they thought you were you know, possessing marijuana, the difference in those two stories might be enough to get your entire case thrown out. So make sure you ask, you know, officer, why am I being detained? The most common response that I hear for activists you know, they'll ask the officer, why am I being detained? And the officer will say, because I said so. Uh, most common response. And if the officer does give you that response, one powerful phrase that really works wonders with them is saying, officer, I, I think you are required to provide me with your reasonable suspicion for detaining me today. And nine times out of 10, they look around for a camera or they ask you if you're a lawyer. And you know, that can really change the dynamic in the conversation pretty quickly. Um, and then again, you know, that other very, very powerful phrase, you know, if you are being detained, you know, if the police officer is grabbing at you or anything like that, you want to follow up with, I don't consent. And just keep repeating it throughout your interaction if needed. I don't consent. 
even if the police officer starts searching you anyway, even if they open up the trunk of the car and they start looking in the trunk of your car, uh, they may have a lawful right to be searching you, but you still have the right to say, I don't consent to the search. You don't have the right to stop them from doing it. You can't get in the middle and try to you know, resist them from that. But say those words, because if it turns out they didn't have a legal basis to search you, uh, the, search, the, the fruits of that search may get thrown out in court. So regardless of whether you think they are allowed to search or not, use that phrase, I don't consent. Just ask if you're free to leave, ask if you're being detained, and then if they say, yeah, you're free to go, put some distance between you and the cop. Particularly if you're at a rally or somewhere where you're standing stable in a crowd, you don't want to continue standing next to the cop pretending like he's not there, because eventually he's going to start trying to ask you questions again. And you know, sometimes people think, oh, well, I'll have some small talk with this cop, or I'll answer a couple of questions, and then he'll leave me alone. Absolutely not. You know, once they find out that you are a source of information, that you're willing to talk to them, uh, they will come back to you time and time again. This is particularly true with regard to the FBI and what are called knock and talks. When an FBI agent just shows up at your door and you know, pretends like he's just there to ask you a few questions about something. You know, if you give any information in those interactions, I can bet you a dollar they're going to be back on your doorstep um, for more. Um, in Oregon, this is another state-specific thing, we are not required to carry ID. The only person that has to have identification on them is the driver of a vehicle, because of course they have to have a driver's license. If you're on a bike, if you're on foot, if you're the passenger in a car, you are not required to show ID. Now, of course, you know one of the most common uh, opening lines for a cop is, let me see some ID. Well, cops are only allowed to ask you to identify yourself if you're being detained. So, you know, you say, am I being detained? And the cop says, yes. Then you are required to identify yourself, which means you are required to give three pieces of information. And that is your name, address, and date of birth. That's it. You never want to give police your social security number. You never want to give them your immigration status or your country of origin. You only have to provide them with name, address, and date of birth. If you don't want to provide that information, they do have the authority to take you into custody, bring you down to the cop shop, run your fingerprints in order to identify yourself. So we generally advise that if you are being detained, that you Basically, you know, as soon as they say, let me see some ID, you should say back to them, my name is this, my address is this, my date of birth is this. Now, if your address is transient, that is a valid address. Um, you don't ever want to lie to the police because giving false information to a police officer is a separate crime. Police also have to identify themselves. They have to give their name, their police agency. Uh, obviously, if they're running down the street after a murder, they don't have to stop and give you that information, but in a reasonable time frame, they do have to give it to you. Um, at the time of detention, now the police are allowed to do what's called a pat-down search. A pat-down search is just patting down the outside of your body, and they're only supposed to be looking for weapons that you could use to hurt them. So they're not allowed to look in your Altoids tin. Uh, you know, because no gun or knife could be held in there. They're also allowed to search within your wingspan, meaning anywhere you could reach to grab a weapon, the police are now going to be able to look there for weapons. So if you're in your car, they're going to be able to open up the console. If you're carrying your backpack on your back, they're going to be able to open up your backpack for the purpose of just looking in and seeing if there's weapons in there or not. When we give this training to unhoused people, we advise them, you know, if possible, try to put some distance between you and your backpack. If you see the cops coming, if you can step you know, more than an arm's distance away from your backpack, they no longer are going to have legal authority to be able to get into that backpack. 
Um, now, of course, you know, they're really only supposed to be doing these searches if they believe that you are a uh, imminent threat to their serious physical injury. But I can tell you I've represented 80-year-old grandmothers whom the police viewed this way. So you should pretty much accept that you will likely have a pat-down search performed on you. And you are entitled to have that search performed by a person of your own gender. So women are permitted to say, I want a female officer present to do this search. Uh, and they are supposed to do everything under the sun to make that happen. Um, also, just so you know, all of your interactions with law enforcement um, must be provided to you in your native language. And so if you, you know, speak a Oaxacan dialect, they are supposed to get on their cell phones to this interpreter service that they all use and hand you the phone. And you are supposed to have live translation in your native language. And of course, you know, dealing with stressful cop interactions, you really want to have it in the language you're most comfortable with. It shouldn't be a time where you're struggling to conjugate verbs in your head you know, as you're interacting with cops. Um, remember to write down everything that you can as soon as possible. You, if you end up arrested, your trial might not happen for a year. You don't want to rely on the police version of what happened in order to refresh your memory down the road. So write out a narrative of what happened as soon as you possibly can. And if possible, try to include cop names and badge numbers. If you ever see a cop with his badge covered up, usually with black electrical tape, this is absolutely illegal. No police policy allows them to cover up their name and badge number. The only reason they do this is because they are out breaking the law doing dirty things. Uh, if you can photograph it, we love suing police departments for that little violation. Um, we see it more often in very large mass protest events. Um, and again, you know, as I said, even that pat down search, we know they're allowed to do it to you if you are being detained, but don't forget to say, I don't consent to this search. Cops are allowed to lie. When the police are investigating a crime, they of course can promise you the sun and the moon and none of it is enforceable at all. The example I usually give, if an undercover police officer is sitting at the kitchen table with a drug cartel and one of the drug dealers asks, are you a cop? Of course, the cop does not have to say, why, yes, I am. Would you like to shoot me here or outside? You know, when they're investigating crimes, they can say anything they want in order to try to get information from you. They can say, if you give us information, we won't take you to jail. They can say, we found a pound of cocaine in your trunk. Your mom snitched you out. You know, all of it is likely to be lies in order to get information out of you. Never trust this information. If you are in a position where the cops are making a promise to you, your response should be, you know, I don't wish to talk with you until I have my lawyer present. You know, if it's a real promise, if they really are offering you something, they'll say it in front of your lawyer, and then it becomes something enforceable. But otherwise, it becomes your word against the cop's word, and that's never a good place to be. Um, and that's the other reason why you should always wait to have a lawyer present before you confess to a crime or make a statement. You know, the cop, you might say the sun rises in the east, the cop writes down, he said the sun rises in the west. Maybe it's a mistake, maybe it was intentional, but now you're in a situation where it's your word versus their word and you're in a bad place. All right. Um, Next stage is arrest. And the police are not allowed to arrest you unless they have probable cause to believe you've committed a crime. And they're not allowed to move you from the location that they found you unless they're placing you under arrest. So in that detention stage, if cop says, come down this dark alley, I want to ask you some questions, you have the right to say, I'd like to stay right here. But once they say you're under arrest, now they get to put the fancy bracelets on you and march you off to the jail. And of course, they can move you under those circumstances. Um, of course, you want to immediately assert your Fifth Amendment rights. You want to say, I want to remain silent, and I want a lawyer. Um, folks under the age of 18 have the exact same rights as adults. 
However, if adults get brought to jail, we might be able to bail ourselves out of jail, what's called release on our own recognizance. For most activist-related crimes, we're going to be able to get ourselves out of jail with the promise of returning to jail and obeying all laws. But minors have to have a parent or guardian physically go to the jail to get them. And so if your teenager is going out of state to a protest, we strongly advise that you get a permission slip, basically, that the parent signs a permission slip, giving another adult guardianship of the kid for the weekend. That piece of paper signed by the parent saying, I give so-and-so permission to be the guardian of my child this weekend, the, you know, now your neighbor can walk into the jail with that piece of paper and get your child out of jail and you don't have to fly off to Oklahoma in order to do so. Um, if you're injured while you're being arrested, you need to be a really squeaky wheel. You want to try to get photographs, you want medical attention. Jail medical care is notoriously awful. Uh, and so you really have to repeatedly be asking for medical care if you need it. That includes, you know, if you have a heart condition or if you're diabetic and you need medications on a regular basis, you might have your insulin in your pocket. The jail medical staff are not going to allow you to use that. It has to come in from an outside pharmacy so that it's not LSD or something like that. And that can often take 48 hours. So, you know, if you need your heart meds every three hours to live, you need to be constantly asking and telling uh, the jail that, you know, this is what you need and why. You know, here's my doctor's name, here's the prescription, um, you know, the drug names, uh, and just try documenting it as, you know, as much as you possibly can. All right. So, as I mentioned, you know, oftentimes with civil disobedience, the police are witnessing you breaking the law. Uh, you certainly, they will have, certainly have a basis to arrest you. Um, also, there's something called an arrest warrant, which means you didn't show up for your court date, and the judge has now issued a formal invitation to you by, you know, telling the cops, go find this person, arrest them, and bring them in front of me. That's called an arrest warrant. Um, now, during the arrest process, I don't know how many people in this room have ever been handcuffed, but there's actually a proper way to get handcuffed. Um, handcuffs, you know, they go around your wrists, and you have these nerves that run down the outside of your wrists that are very vulnerable to being bruised. And so the way that you should try to position your hands, you know, as soon as the cop says you're under arrest, you know, my advice is you turn and you want to put your hands with your thumbs together like you're praying, you know, like this. Because this is going to be the position that you want to try to keep your hands in the entire time you have handcuffs on. It will protect your radial nerves to the maximum extent possible, especially women uh, start twisting their wrists inside the handcuffs trying to find a more comfortable position. There is no comfortable position in handcuffs and the more you twist, the more um, damage and pain you're likely going to be causing to yourself. Also, um, if you basically don't just, you know, go put your hands behind your back as soon as they say you're under arrest, if you put your arms underneath you or you do anything to make it so that they can't put your hands in handcuffs, that may result in a resisting arrest charge. However, passive resistance, going limp, you know, flopping down on the floor and making them cart your ass to the cop car is not resisting arrest, but you truly do have to go limp. You know, you have to become a rag doll. Um, and for people who engage in lockdowns, you know, where you are locking yourself to something or you are somehow making it so that you are immovable, that is also not resisting arrest. But we do encourage people, uh, as the police come upon them uh, with their arm in a cement barrel, to say, uh, you know, I am not resisting arrest. You know, I am passively resisting right now or, you know, something like that. Chances are, like I said, you're being recorded and saying words like that will help protect you from being charged with resisting arrest. Resisting arrest is a pretty serious class A misdemeanor, um, but it looks really bad on your record because then, you know, for every other interaction you have with the cops, you know, you get pulled over for speeding, they run your license, 
the words, you know, resisting arrest come up on the screen, and now the cop thinks you're a fighter, and he's going to treat you accordingly. And so trying to keep resisting arrest off your record uh, is, you know, an important asset to activists. Um, now, once you're under arrest, they take you off to this jail, and they are allowed to do what's called a skin search. What this means is that they're now allowed to look for weapons and contraband. They will also make you remove anything of value. So all your jewelry, uh, you know, things like that will be removed. Now, uh, we actually make a special Know Your Rights brochure for those of you with transdermal piercings. Um, for those of you that don't know, transdermal piercings are the ones that look like a little piece of metal in your cheek or something. Um, those piercings actually, um, they go under your skin and then they open up like a little butterfly under the surface of your skin and you can't take those out yourself. You have to have a piercer with a special tool in order to get those out. Jails did not know this for quite a while, and so they would say, remove your piercings, and the person would say, I can't. They said, well, either you're going to do it or we're going to do it, and they would say things like, I need to have a piercer. I really can't take it out. Uh, we had one person who just had the cops come at him with pliers and ripped it out of their face. We sued those police um, and won, and so then we made this little brochure about what a transdermal piercing is and how they are removed and sent them to every jail in Oregon to put them on notice that if this ever happened again, we would be suing them again. Um, so folks with transdermal piercings, you know, you've got a little extra challenge if you end up in custody. Um, but know that, you know, before you go off to a demo or rally, even if you have no intention of being arrested, it really is safest to remove your wedding ring, you know, any jewelry that you have, particularly things of value. Um, also, just to mention it, wedding rings in particular, you know, a lot of women can't get them off their fingers anymore. You really don't want the, you know, Multnomah County Sheriff being the person to remove your wedding ring by cutting it off your finger. Uh, so just be aware of that. All right. So your Fifth Amendment right, your invocation of your Fifth Amendment rights called taking the fifth or invoking your Fifth Amendment rights. This magic phrase, I am going to remain silent and I want a lawyer, puts a magic bubble around you that makes it so that the police have to legally stop questioning you. They are not permitted to ask you questions once you have uttered this phrase. Now, if you get nervous in the back street seat of a cop car, you know, you've made your invocation of Fifth Amendment rights, you've put the magic bubble around you, and then you get nervous and you start chit-chatting with the cop, you've just popped your own bubble. And now the cop is allowed to question you again. But just by repeating that phrase again, you can put the bubble back around you and be protected again. Sometimes people think that you're entitled to one phone call. That's not true. You're allowed a reasonable number of phone calls in order to obtain a lawyer uh, or to make contact with your family to help you find a lawyer. Uh, and even if you don't know how to spell the word lawyer, you should say this phrase because it makes that magic bubble around you. Um, also, this is a fundamental right, meaning that often the police will say, well, if you didn't do anything wrong, why do you need a lawyer, you know, or something like that. You know, exercising your constitutional rights can never be used against you to prove that you are guilty of a crime. That's another one of those lies that cops tell people in order to get information out of them. So you've all probably heard Miranda rights on TV, you know, uh, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law, blah, 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 blah. The police do not have to read you their, your Miranda rights, nor should you ever rely on the police to tell you what your rights are. It is not in the cop's best interests to have you know what your rights are. So you need to know them before you ever uh, are interacting with them. So we kind of came up with an easier version for you to memorize. Uh, one of the handouts has this on one side of it. And basically, I'm not going to talk to you or anyone about anything. Because who's the only person that can ever make you answer a question? A judge in a courtroom. I want a lawyer present before I speak to you or anyone. 
You know, you want that witness. You know, not only would it be nice for you to take some legal advice once you end up in a jail cell, but you want somebody there to be able to witness what you're saying. Uh, I won't answer any questions or reply to any charges without my lawyer present. Now, in Oregon, once you're arrested, you have to be brought in front of a judge within 48 hours. So in the worst case scenario, you will go without a lawyer for 48 hours. But once you walk into that courtroom for what's called your arraignment, uh, you will be entitled to apply for a court-appointed lawyer if you need one, and that person's usually present there. Um, in Washington, California, a lot of other states, it's 72 hours. That's usually about the longest that they will make you go um, before you are brought in front of a judge. I don't agree to perform any test, consent to any searches, participate in lineups, um, or any you know, DNA tests, blood tests, voice exemplar, hair exemplar, writing exemplars. You know, all of those require a warrant, and you should never consent to them. They may make you do them anyway. Um, but you, by you saying, I don't consent to this search, if you are making me do it, I will comply with this demand, but I don't consent to it. And that will give you protection if it ends up in court. Um, now, there is one big exception to this rule. When you got a driver's license, for those of you that have driver's licenses, uh, in exchange for given, giving the privilege to drive on the roads, you consented to certain uh, alcohol-related tests, primarily the breath test. You said that if a police officer has a reasonable basis to believe that you were driving a vehicle on a public roadway under the influence of alcohol or an intoxicant, you would blow in this little tube. Um, you also agreed to do what are called non-testimonial field sobriety tests. And what that means is um, tests that don't make you snitch on yourself like um, you know, nose, fingers to nose or walking a line. Those are non-testimonial because they don't require you to say words. But how many beers have you had? Or on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you think you did on these tests? Or count from 1 to 100? Those all make words come out of your mouth that will likely potentially snitch you out. You know, if you start one, two, three, and you're slurring your words, you've just proven to the police officer that you're likely intoxicated. And so you don't have to consent to those. But you know, following the little pen, which is called the horizontal gaze nystagmus test, um, or uh, you know, going like this, or walking the line, or you know, any of those tests, those physical type tests, you are required to do. If you don't do them, you lose your license for one year, period. Even if you end up not being drunk or not being under the influence, you'll still lose your license for one year because you've breached that deal you made with DMV. Um, don't sign anything unless your lawyer tells you to. And make sure that what you're signing, if you are going to sign anything, is in your native language so you can read and understand it. The one exception to this is what's called a jail release agreement. If you don't sign a release agreement, you don't get out of jail. So we advise people, read it over, sign it, just to get yourself out of jail. If it has crazy stuff in it that concerns you, contact your lawyer right away. We can go in in front of the judge and get stuff changed if it ends up being uh, you know, uh, unreasonable. But sign it, get out of jail. Uh, and then finally, if there's one thing that you remember from this training, if you can spit out the words, I don't want to waive my constitutional rights, you will kind of bare bones cover your butt. Um, grand juries. We actually do a whole one hour training on grand juries, but the short version is a grand jury is a secret tribunal uh, that is established to file felony charges. So whether it's conspiracy to overthrow the government or murder or a felony drug case, all of those matters must go in front of a grand jury in order to become formal charges. Um, people, activists, uh, movements, especially radical movements, have been the targets of grand juries as a tool of repression by the state. They will subpoena a bunch of activists and force them to go to a grand jury and snitch on each other or give information about the movement that they're a part of. Now, most radical um, movements or most activists in general, their opponent is the government. 
you know, you're fighting a timber sale, you're fighting big banks, you're anti-war, whatever it is, usually the government is your opponent. And so there is a choice that most activists have to make historically. Are you going to cooperate with your opponent or are you going to remain in solidarity with the movement that you've been fighting with for a long time? And that is an ethical choice that many activists have had to face in, in confronting grand juries. Now, if you um, are subpoenaed to a grand jury, please contact us right away. We'll help you get a lawyer. We'll give you a lot more detailed information than what I'm providing to you today. Um, because there are some complications. Um, you know, do know that those people who have chosen to resist grand juries and to not testify um, often are found in civil contempt of court, which means they can go to jail for up to six months for not committing any crime at all except not testifying. Okay, the next phrase is um, those words we want you to memorize, those sample conversations with police. And again, you know, the three stages, uh, mere conversation, detention, and arrest. So at that mere conversation stage, cop walks up to you and says, who's the leader of this protest or something like that? And you're gonna say, am I detaining, I mean, are you detaining me or am I free to leave? Are you detaining me? The cop's going to say something like, well, what are you afraid of? If you weren't doing anything wrong, you'd answer my questions. You know, blah, 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 blah. Aren't we all friends here? Or something to that effect. And you should say, you know, I, I wish, I choose not to speak with you. Thank you. And then just slowly walk away. You, know, you don't have to be rude or obnoxious or anything like that. The idea is to get the encounter over with as fast as possible and get out of there so that you don't have to interact with that cop anymore. Don't forget, at this stage, the cop can't detain, you know, can't hold on to you. He can't ask you to identify yourself. He can't make you show ID. Uh, he can't search you in any, you know, way, shape, or form. Um, next phase, detention. It starts off the same way. Hey, I want to ask you a couple of questions. You say, are you detaining me or am I free to leave? And this time he says, I'm detaining you. So what this tells you is this cop believes that he has a reasonable suspicion that you've committed a crime or are about to commit a crime. He's now allowed to do that pat-down search of you um, with, you know, with someone of your own gender, and now you're required to identify yourself. And again, that's name, address, date of birth. You know, one thing I forgot to mention earlier, you know, the other reason we are really advocating that people just provide name, address, date of birth um, is because there are a lot of people in this country that can no longer get ID, you know, that can no longer get a driver's license. There was a law passed in 2006 called the Real ID Act, um, which makes it impossible for undocumented people to be able to get even a driver's license or a photo ID. And so in order to exercise our privilege of having a driver's license, you know, we want to stand in solidarity with those that don't. And so by not simply whipping out our privilege, we are, you know, helping those that aren't able to whip out an ID in interacting with cops. The other thing is that your driver's license contains what's called an RFID chip in the back of it. This chip can be scanned by a cop, you know, through a special reader, and it contains a lot of information. Not only your fingerprints, retina scans in certain states, your record, but any other little notes that the cops want to put into this database, including Tar Sands Resistor, now called Eco Warrior Gang Member, uh, and other, you know, weird things like that. So why would you want to give the cop all of that extra information that they wouldn't have access to and aren't entitled to? Now, despite the fact, of course, that that is the law, we all know that cops sometimes break the law. Um, and by giving you this information, I am not asking you to put aside common sense. You know, if a cop says, show me your ID or you're going to jail, you should probably assume that they're going to, you know, be good to their word and it's time for you to decide, is this important for me to exercise my right right now or do I want to avoid going to jail? You know, so sometimes what the law says and what you are faced with on the streets can be two different things and I'm not telling you that that does not happen and that you don't need to uh, think accordingly. Um, but don't forget, you know, if you are being detained, don't forget to ask why you're being detained and memorize what that response is. 
And then finally, you know, sometimes it just goes from zero to 100 and the cop walks up to you and says, you're under arrest. And in that case, you should say, uh, I want to remain silent and I want a lawyer. And as I mentioned, generally speaking, I think it's usually best to turn, put your hands together and await handcuffs. All right, um, so civil disobedience consequences for those of us in Oregon. Um, so most types of crimes that activists are going to be arrested are mostly going to be misdemeanors. Uh, a misdemeanor basically means um, that the maximum punishment possible is one year in jail, $6,250 fine, and up to five years of unsupervised probation, which means you don't have a probation officer, you don't have to piss in a cup, uh, you, know, you just basically have to obey all laws and do what the judge says. Now, of course, that's the maximum, and I've never seen an activist get anywhere close, close to that. Um, very rarely, um, activists will get charged with felonies. Uh, felonies also can carry prison time instead of jail time, um, and then you do get a probation officer. Um, there are also other serious consequences to felonies, like losing your right to bear arms, losing your right to vote in certain circumstances, etc. Misdemeanor charges, you know, the judge uh, can jail you, can fine you, uh, there's community service, there's road crew, uh, there's all sorts of options that are potentially on the table. Now, the prosecutor, you know, the DA, the person who uh, is working for the state that is putting you through the court system, often has an option to take that misdemeanor trespassing charge and drop it down to what's called a violation. A violation is sometimes also called an infraction. And basically, it's like a speeding ticket or a dog at large. But that trespassing misdemeanor could be dropped down to a trespassing violation. And the big difference between a violation and a misdemeanor is there is no threat of jail. The only thing that the court can do to you is fine you and take some money from you. Um, and most courts now will also give you the option of doing community service instead of paying money. Um, there's also something called diversion that is usually available to first-time offenders, particularly for nonviolent protest. A diversion basically says, jump through a few hoops, obey all laws for six months, and at the end of the six-month time period, the state dismisses your charges so that you don't end up with anything on your record. Um, also know that in Oregon, if you have one conviction on your record, you are likely going to be able to expunge your record, which means get everything erased off your record three years from the date of conviction. If you have two or more convictions on your record, you have to wait 10 years from the date of the last conviction. But then you're actually legally allowed to say, I've never been arrested or convicted. Once the judge signs that paperwork, it legally goes away forever. All right, um, you basically have no rights at borders. Uh, border regions are now considered 500 miles from the border. We actually figured that, that that's like almost all of the state of Washington and almost most of California. Uh, that is what a border region is. And within those regions, we've basically lost most of our constitutional rights, particularly the right to not consent to searches and seizures. Border patrol are allowed to look for humans in your trunk, you know, in other places, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, CLDC and a group of lawyers that we work with wrote to the federal government and said, what are our rights at the border? Because we researched the snot out of it and we couldn't find the answers. So we wrote to the government and said, please provide us lawyers with your rights at the border. And we got a response back saying we weren't going to tell you that because of national security interests. So apparently not knowing is how they'd like to have this operate. But um, do know that people have had their laptops and their cell phones, outreach materials and other things seized and searched at the border, both Canadian and Mexican. So we're advising, you know, if you're going up for a road show, you may want to mail your thumb drive or your outreach materials in advance. You may want to back up your phone and clear it of your contacts and your other things because the government is taking this information and putting it into these databases and using it against movements and activists. Um, for those of you that work with non-documented populations, just very briefly, um, one difference between immigration and customs enforcement, which is called ICE, 
also called La Migra by Latino communities. Um, the big difference is, you know, cops, if they have a search warrant, they can break down your door and enter. With ICE, if they come to the door with a deportation warrant, they're not allowed to break down the door. The only way that they can get in that door is if somebody lets them. And so we advise people, just stand at the door, say, who are you? If they say ICE or a government agent, you're literally allowed to say, we don't want to talk to you, and they're, they got to walk away. You're even allowed to say, slip the papers under the door, and you can read them and slip them back out and say, sorry, we don't want to play that game. Uh, and that's all legal. Um, in the immigration context, if you don't assert your rights, you waive them. Literally, uh, you could be on a bus back to your country of origin within 24 hours if you don't demand an immigration hearing. Um, and as I mentioned before, legal stuff is not the time to be relying on your 12-year-old child to interpret for you or a kindly neighbor. You want a real interpreter that takes an oath to translate accurately and honestly. Um, and um, in immigration context, even if you can't afford a lawyer, you're not allowed, you don't get one. You have to pay for a lawyer in immigration land. Um, never sign anything that you don't read and understand. You could literally be signing your own deportation order. Um, immigrants, people here on visas and I-94s, must carry their papers with them at all times. If you're asked to present your green card and you don't have it on you, that's an immigration violation. Um, and then finally, you know, immigration laws are constantly changing. Uh, immigration law is the fastest changing area of the law right now. So what I tell you today may not be accurate a month from now. Make sure you contact a lawyer. Now, one of the most shocking things that I learned from learning immigration law, you know, the deportation process, once somebody gets picked up for deportation, the process normally takes about a year. They're shipped up to Tacoma and they're in court for over a year. While they're in jail, their children have been taken by Child Protective Services and are put into foster care. Six months after they're arrested, their parental rights are terminated and their children are put up for adoption against their will. And so when we do immigration trainings in communities, we actually bring power of attorney forms with us and we tell the families, Find a documented person who will be the guardian of your child, who you give written permission to go get your kid out of CPS. What happens from there, the adults can work it out. You know, maybe the kid gets on a bus, you know, back to Mexico to go live with grandma for a while, but we want that to be that parent's choice, not the state's choice. And the only way to avoid that is by having these power of attorney forms filled out in advance. Um, Finally, the most common way that people end up in deportation is from driving, uh, and often DUIs. But you get pulled over, they ask for a driver's license, you don't have one, now it becomes an arrestable offense. Once you go to jail, ICE is constantly checking the databases for non-American sounding names. If they check a name and it doesn't come back with a visa status or US citizenship, then they can put an immigration hold on that person remotely from a computer. And that is the most common way that people end up being deported these days. Um, on the back side of that demand of rights is this legal flow chart. And I'm just going to really briefly go through it. It's basically what happens to you from the time that you are arrested to the time you spit out the end of the legal system. Uh, so for the purposes of this training, we're going to pretend that we're all going to go lock down to the megalode. Um, and so, you know, we, the um, you know, cops come up and they say, leave or be arrested. You know, we're closing this area off. You have a choice, leave or be arrested. That's your warning up at the top in the purple. More often than not, in the protest context, they will give you a warning. Once that warning is made, you have a choice. You can either leave and thus avoid being arrested, or if you remain, you should be prepared that you will likely be arrested. Um, if the cops then come up to you and say you're under arrest, if you give your basic information, your name, address, date of birth, there is at least a chance that they could do what's called sight and release, which is where they give you a ticket and tell you to get out of there. Um, it's getting more rare 
that they will do that because they want to get your fingerprints, your mugshot, your digital retina scan, and get you into their databases. So it's hard to get them to cite and release these days, but sometimes it can be negotiated. Um, if you don't give them name, address, date of birth, like I mentioned, they now have the right to take you to jail no matter what, just to find out who you are. Once you get to the jail, you'll be encountering the booking area. This is where they take your mugshot, fingerprints, and basic information. Don't forget that this is also a cop. You know, this is also law enforcement. So don't chit chat and you know tell them a bunch of things that you would normally have not have told your arresting officer. Um, they will likely ask you, you know, do you have a job or do you have ties to the community? The reason they're asking you those questions is to determine bail. Um, so, you know, if you are employed and that's something you're okay with telling them, it makes it easier to get you released on your own recognizance. Um, if you have failure to appear on your record, meaning you didn't show up for court in the past, it's going to be much harder to get you out of jail. If you're on probation at the time you get arrested, also much harder to get you out of jail. Um, and if you have warrants from some other place, um, very difficult to get you out of jail. So you should be taking very low risk of arrest if you're engaging in protest activity. Um, so then they'll ask you to sign that release agreement that I told you you should go ahead and, and sign, and then you'll be popped out of jail. And the next thing that will happen to you is your arraignment. Now, if for some reason you're not allowed out, you know, you're not bailed and you're not released on your own recognizance, you will be brought in front of the judge for an arraignment within 48 hours. Arraignment is where they give you a piece of paper that tells you what you're being charged with. You always want to enter a not guilty plea at arraignment. You can change your plea down the road to guilty if you decide that's what you're going to do, but you can never reverse the two. Once you plead guilty, you are literally throwing yourself on the mercy of the court. And it is best to get some legal advice, get some negotiations, and kind of try to work out a least punishment possible before you go in front of a judge and to be sentenced. Um, so we just plead not guilty, leave. Your next court date's normally about a month away. In that time period, your lawyer gets all the police reports, uh, talks to the prosecutor, you know, sees what's going on, and then you have a choice. Do you want a plea bargain or do you want to go to trial? And this choice is entirely yours. You are the boss of your lawyer. Your lawyer will give you lots of advice, you know, and you can take that or leave that, but ultimately what happens in your case is yours. You, know, you are the driver of this little car. Um, if you choose to take a plea bargain, then you'll be pleading guilty or no contest. Uh, no contest is sometimes called nolo contendre, and it basically means I'm not going to plead guilty, but I'm going to take advantage of this plea bargain. I know that if I go to trial, there might be a chance that I'm going to get convicted, so I'm going to take advantage of this. But by not pleading guilty, um, if you were going to be sued, for economic damages or something by the corporation, you're not making it easy on them. They will have to prove everything in civil court. Um, but on your record, it looks like a guilty conviction, the same as if you pled guilty. If you want to retain your not guilty plea, then you're going to trial. And you have the right to represent yourself. You have the right to have a lawyer. Uh, you have the right to be represented with a group of co-defendants or by yourself. And then you also have the right to a jury trial or a bench trial, meaning just to the judge. And the jury hears the evidence and comes out with a verdict, guilty or not guilty. But the judge is the one that will impose punishment if you are found guilty. If you're found not guilty, that's called an acquittal. And then you're done. You know, all that stress and uh, paperwork, and then you are popped out of the other end of the system. If you are found guilty and you're sentenced, that's where the judge can fine you, impose probation, community service, jail, um, alcohol classes, you know, you name it. If you comply with those court orders, then you will get out of the legal system and be done. If you violate one of the terms of those probation um, requirements, then they get to bring another lawsuit basically called a probation violation where they can spank you a second time for that same crime and repunish you again.
Activists also just have to be aware that there is a form of a civil lawsuit that's called a SLAP suit, which stands for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation. And this is when a corporation sues activists or their campaign in order to try to silence them uh, and seek an injunction so that they can't go anywhere near the pipeline or you know oftentimes they're even seeking things like you can't talk naughty about us on the internet uh, and things of that nature. Um, the way these lawsuits start is the corporation files a complaint and that complaint has to be served on the people who are listed as plaintiffs and once the lawsuit is served activists only have 30 days in order to file a response with their defenses and answers. And so when we first started working with the tar sands blockade down in Texas, TransCanada filed a slap suit against them, but nobody knew that there was only a 30-day window, and we didn't get involved until long after that. So when we went to court and tried to assert constitutional defenses and First Amendment defenses for them, the court had discretion to allow us to argue the Constitution or not, and the Texas judge declined to exercise that discretion in our favor so that the organization was compelled to settle with TransCanada. And as a result, everybody involved in that campaign had an injunction against them from going within 500 feet of the pipeline even for lawful purposes. And so literally, it almost crushed that group's ability to be engaging in that campaign. So the lesson learned is if you smell a slap suit taking place in your community, you need to contact us and we'll help you get lawyers right away because the clock starts ticking you know, really quickly and it can really be a serious impact on the campaign and the activists that are involved. Uh, now a slap suit, you know, like I mentioned, can get an injunction, it can also get monetary penalties from people. And so uh, in the Texas situation, you know, there were a few people that had assets and they became very nervous that if they were found liable in this slap suit that their personal wealth could be seized. And that ended up putting enormous pressure on the other activists that were a little more ragtag to settle under terms that they might not have wanted to settle because of concern for their comrade whose house was in jeopardy. So you need to be you know, thoughtful of those types of matters. Uh, you know, here in Portland, uh, there were some animal rights activists um, that had a slap suit filed against them by the owner of a first store. And not only did they win that slap suit, but they also made the first store pay their attorney fees and costs. So that was actually a great outcome um, but that was because they were really proactive and they got lawyers involved really quickly. Um, I mean, we do have constitutional rights and the corporations can't take those away yet. So uh, just make sure that you're aware of that as another possibility, uh, you know, another little training and another tool to stick away in your activist toolkit. And with that, um, we conclude this part of the training. Uh, everybody, of course, probably is familiar with Martin Niemöller. Um, you know, we think this is extremely apropos in these times as well. Um, and um, with that, I am happy to take questions. Also, just so folks know, I did leave my business cards over on the table. On the back side of it is your rights, a little mini version of your rights. Um, I'm always so proud when I get discovery and the police reports say, you know, so-and-so activists whipped out this legal card and said that they were going to not talk and things like that. So oftentimes I will tell people, you know, if you're in an awkward situation with the cops, I give you permission to blame it on me. You can say, this lawyer told